Let's turn to what's going on in this country and I presume in other countries um, around the world to some degree, and maybe it's not necessarily the same dynamic, but we're hearing stories, they're I mean, not stories, uh, they're uh, full on reports of how backed up we are at our ports in terms of uh, ships in the sea. It seems to be a function of, or at least one element of it is, the nature of the truckers who are tasked with picking stuff up at a port and the way that they're paid or i should say not paid um there's can you tell us what's going on with our supply yeah. lines relative to what's happening with the with the ships so i think that there are actually multiple things going on that is that is causing the sort of the global supply chain backup so first when we came out of the first lockdown there were a lot of containers out of place if you will which meant that there was actually a shortage of containers in you know the, the, the container boxes which transport aboard ships and actually make multimodal transportation i.e transportation of goods between um uh between ships and rail and roads, so trucks, possible because those you know those standardized containers um, easily transfer between them. Um, so these containers were out of place. There were empty containers where people uh, didn't need sort of didn't need an empty containers, weren't filling up those empty empty containers. So loads of empty containers located in, for example, ports of Europe um, and Americas where China needed them, and not enough empty containers in China. And so you had that first thing that emerged um, that caused some problems. The second thing that, um, that, that that caused a lot of the problems was that, of course, China, because of its very stringent rules around COVID and its very stringent shutdowns, essentially shut down the global factory in really quite drastic sorts of ways. So, so the global, the, 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 the production node of the supply chain um, really came to a halt. But that also, um, I, I mean, people don't remember this, but the, a number of ports in China were actually completely zero shut down. There was nothing going in or out of them in the first uh, sort of at the beginning of the pandemic, so in around the beginning of 2020, but it has continued, China has continued to shut down some of its ports, which means that goods cannot come in and uh, raw materials cannot come in and goods cannot leave. And so because those ports are shut down. And so, of course, given the centrality of China to these webs of trade, um, that really generates um, a huge problem in, in terms of uh, goods. But then in the case of the US, the US has some very specific problems of its own. On the one hand, it has only a handful of uh, ports that can handle some of these bigger ships. So uh, LA and Long Beach, for example, Oakland possibly, um, and a few ports on the East Coast. Um, and that means that these, these particular ports end up being massively congested when the ships arrive. They just can't get a berth to unload the ships. But then you have the land-based issues that are going on. And we have issues in the UK around Brexit. We don't have enough drivers to drive uh, the ships. In the US, the problem is slightly different. In the US, essentially, the process by which truck drivers were involved in, the, in, in picking up goods, picking up containers out of the ports, um, was that these um, truck drivers would arrive at the port and when there was some good for them to transport, they would be, essentially, they would be called upon to do so. In essence, I was just reading this somewhere. Uh, somebody was comparing this to sitting there unpaid, waiting for somebody to give you a job. So essentially, when you actually look at it, the amount of uh, money that they were earning divided by the time that they were spending would end up be massively sort of diminished uh, their wages. Um, and that has, that, that has translated into extreme unhappiness happiness on, on the part of these truck drivers. And so you also see that a lot of people are dropping out of that sort of process. And or you're also seeing I'm, I'm hearing sort of sounds, uh, uh, news about uh, strikes, um, unionization among these drivers in lots of locations. Um, so, so that the sort of the congestion on the land side is another factor around this. And again, this has also to do with the way that the both the wage structures, but also the physical infrastructures have functioned over the course of the last few years. And the sort of the, the slight break, the slight this, uh, uh, disjuncture that the pandemic created has suddenly thrown um, a, a, a sort of massive spotlight on, on issues that people have managed to sort of put a Band-Aid over and now suddenly can't. So how does this longer. get, I mean, you know, the, the, the different problems that you've, you've mentioned, it's, it's easier to see how some of them can get resolved than others, right? I mean, at one point, there won't be a pandemic. 
um, uh, th theoretically. <laughs> um, let's uh, knock on wood. Uh, but with this trucker thing in particular, like, you know, why would I be an independent trucker and go to these ports? I mean, it, it seems like we're, we're in a feedback loop with that, right? Because why would I go to this port, wait maybe 20 hours to get to get that uh and i'm getting i'm not getting paid by the hour i'm getting paid by the load so i'm doing half the amount of loads that i could have maybe three years ago uh so i don't have the potential to make this money and i but the the port needs me to show up and take this stuff off so that we can start to sort of like get the log jam going but there's few of us fewer of me as an independent trucker going there there's a feedback loop here obviously because it gets it gets more crowded, takes longer for you to get the your cargo. You decide, I'm not doing that. I'll go get a job paid hourly for some uh, shipping company, or I'm going to go do, I don't know, concerts are happening again. Maybe I'll do those. But so how does this get resolved? I mean, what? So this is... So yeah, this is a fantastic question. And I think actually it goes back to the fact that ports often have been the site of casualized labor. I mean, we look at the gig economy, right? We look at the Uber drivers or delivery drivers or Lyft drivers, and we think that this is something new. But in fact, actually port workers, whether the truck drivers or old school stevedores and dockers, certainly in the UK, were actually casualized. They would arrive at the gate of the port and would hope that somebody takes them up to unload a ship at a given time. That was the case in the UK actually until the 1970s. If you think about that, that's actually really, shocking. So what we're, what people were expected to do was precisely that, to just go on ahead and waste their own time waiting out there for goods to be taken up. I mean, looking at it from a left-wing point of view, the only solution is for, a pro for proper employment for uh, for these truck drivers so that they can actually go on ahead and if they have to wait, they're getting paid for it. They're not, that this idea of independent worker, you know, your own your right. own boss is, some, is a kind of a fantasy. It's, you are not your own boss. You're, what you're doing is you're self-exploiting on behalf of whoever it is that is benefiting, whether it's Uber or Lyft or Deliveroo, or in this case, it's the shipping companies from your from from the fact that you are actually eating the the hours that you're sitting there uh, doing nothing. And so, in a sense, this process of casualization has to end if we're looking to some sort of a solution that is longer lasting and just on behalf of these truck drivers. But also, if we want the supply chains to be more resilient, the problem is that resiliency and if efficiency are actually uh, at odds. And if we want resilient, we want functioning, we want uh, uh, just processes, just supply chains, that means that those processes of efficiency, pushing down wages, uh, disciplining labor is just not going to be working very well in, in a long term way. I, I just I I I, I want to just end on that 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 note about resiliency and efficiency being at loggerheads, just to be clear with people like what what that means. If I'm going to do all my like an on demand supply chain, it's going to be very efficient. But all it takes is one little break, and I've got no extra of those widgets that I need to complete my car or whatever it is i'm building uh, if i'm going to just do the same on demand with labor it's going to save me money but that's not going to guarantee that the labor is going to be there because at one point they're going to go like I, this i'm getting this is horrible uh, for me so i'm not going to show up i mean we we have this throughout that process so people should understand that concept that if we want to make sure that we have a resilient supply chain, we're going to have to pay a little bit more um, yeah. uh, because it's going to be you're paying for the resiliency as opposed to the uh, efficiency. Um, yeah. It's, I mean, it's interesting because the ever given thing actually made this extremely clear because so many different the, the blockage of the Suez Canal, not just the goods that were on ever given, but on the whatever hundreds of ships that were stuck on either side of the Suez Canal in the Mediterranean and in the Red Sea. Um, that that made it clear because the, so many of the just in time manufacturing processes that were dependent on goods that were ship sitting on those ships that were delayed actually broke down during that period. And so there was that was part, you know, that actually makes incredibly clear that we 
are operating an enormously complex machine and having everything stretched taut in order to, to make it efficient actually means that even the smallest breakages are going to make the whole entire machine collapse. And so I think that is something that we really need to be aware of. Redundancies are really important, not, not job redundancies, but sort of having multiple possibilities, but also higher wages, more commitment you know, to, to, to the people who are working, making the, the system work um, is really important if we want the system to actually be resilient. Lolly Khalil, uh, the professor of international politics at Queen Mary University of London, and the book is Sinews of War and Trade, Shipping and Capitalism in the Arabian Peninsula. Thank you so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. We're going to put a link to that at majority.fm. Lovely. I really enjoyed it. Thanks very much, Thanks so Sam much. and Emma.